Hi there! Last time we saw two lesser known tricks in the Unity API that can be either very useful or completely useless to you. Today I have another batch of similar, lesser known tricks. But this time I am almost sure you'll adopt at least some of them if you weren't familiar with them before. Because I use them all the time. So buckle up. Let's say we have a physics-based player controller, and it has multiple serialized fields, a reference to a rigid body, a movement speed, and a rotation speed. Really minimalistic. Assuming that our component requires the rigid body to be on the same game object, what I often see is this pattern. In Awake, people often check if the rigid body is assigned, and if not, they find the component and assign it manually. Now this is completely valid, and the thing I'm going to show you next doesn't necessarily absolve us from doing this. What we can do is search for the component during edit time instead of runtime, potentially saving some performance. And most of you are probably familiar with the next thing I'm going to show you, the onValidate callback. You can put your initialization logic into this method, and if the component wasn't dynamically created, the field will be populated in the editor. But what if I told you that this is the incorrect method to do it? On validate is executed every time the component changes. This means that with this code, if we were to assign a different rigid body in the editor, it would be immediately overridden by the code in the on validate method. And of course, we can safeguard it the same way I did in the awake method, but there's another way of doing it. Unity has another callback made specifically for this kind of situations. It's called reset. The reset method is executed only once, when the component is added to the object. OnValidate is great for other things or other situations. For example, you might want your rotation speed to be always twice the movement speed, so you can do that during OnValidate. Let's see it in action. I'll create an empty game object, and when I add the player controller to it, the require component attribute adds the rigid body component to it, and the reset method populates the rigid body field. If I change the value in the movement speed field, you can see that the rotation speed changes as well, and it always twice the size. Now, there are a couple of edge cases when we're talking about reset and onValidate methods. Both of them are editor only, so if you change the movement speed at runtime, the rotation speed won't change and the reset method won't be called. By the way, you can trigger the reset method at any moment manually by pressing on the three dots button and selecting reset. And here's something that in my opinion contributed heavily to many Unity developers not adopting proper object-oriented patterns. If you want polymorphism, Unity was blocking you part of the time. For example, you have a damage effect interface, and it might have an execute method in it. If you wanted to serialize it and be able to set any implementation there, it's impossible. So what I'd often see is an abstract class that must be a monobehavior because Unity doesn't have the ability to select a regular class in the editor. This class represents our window to polymorphism, so we can put the execute method here. Lastly, we can serialize this abstract class instead of the interface. But this feels wrong to me. Not only it's limited polymorphism, it forces us to use monobehaviors or scriptable objects with all of their overhead instead of using a slim class that does only what it's supposed to do. It all changed in Unity 2019.3, when Unity introduced the serialize reference attribute. With this attribute, at last we can serialize interfaces. What it does is make the serializer save not only the data of the object, but also its type. Now I can drop the abstract class and start implementing the interface. I'll create two effects. First, fire damage. Notice that this is a regular class, not a monobehavior. It can have some serialized fields like damage and it should implement the interface. I'll just log here. We're doing fire damage with this damage amount. And I also paste the code for ice damage here. Same logic, just logging the data. Lastly, I want to execute the selected effect. So in the start method, I'll just invoke the execute method of the interface. Now let's go to Unity. I'll create a weapon object and add the weapon component to it. And oh. Where's the serialization? The thing is, Unity doesn't have a type picker for regular classes. 
Why is that? Honestly, I don't really know. I mean, it's kind of easy to implement, and we'll get to that shortly, but the power of serialized reference is not only in serializing interfaces. With this attribute, you are actually serializing a reference and not its values, meaning multiple fields can have the same item, just like with monobehaviors but with custom classes. Let me show you what I mean. I'll duplicate the serialized reference, and then in the reset method, I'll create a new instance of fire damage. Then I can assign this instance to both of the fields. Let's get back to Unity to see what it does. You can see that both of the fields are serialized now. Not only that, since it's the same instance, if I change the damage on one of them, the second one also changes. So Unity does know how to serialize any type here. It just doesn't have the type picker, and we can fix that. We can either write our own, or we can just pick up something generic that somebody has already made. There are a couple of solutions online, and you can pick whichever you like most. Here's one long-living solution with a decent number of stars. And I'll leave the links for all of those in the description. I'll just open the terminal and install it via OpenUPM. For other ways of installation, refer to the documentation. Once the package is installed, I need to add the subclass selector attribute to the serialized reference, and that's it. I'll just clean up a little here and get rid of the reset method. Back in the editor, you can see the null value next to the damage effect field. We can open the dropdown and select one of the available types. When selecting any of those, Unity will construct a new instance and assign the reference. And immediately we can edit the data of this class. If I change from fire damage to ice damage, the damage field changes to slow amount. Note that the package I've imported only handles the type picker. It has nothing to do with saving data, displaying it in the editor, or letting us modify it. That part is provided by Unity. Now, why Unity hasn't added the type picker in the last six years is beyond me, but I guess they have other priorities. The last thing I want is for them to cancel Core CLR in favor of a type picker. I've left with only one thing to show you today. It's the add component menu attribute. Most of you are probably familiar with it, but I have two tricks some of you might not know. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, here's what it does. If I have a component, I can specify where to place it in the add component menu. Let's say under a my game section with the name my amazing button. And I'm not repeating the name of the class on purpose. Now in Unity, I can create a new game object and start adding a component to it. You can see the my game category here and inside is my component, which is titled my amazing button. And even when I'm adding this component, it keeps the name I provided in the attribute and not the name of the class. So far, the basics. Now for the tricks. Sometimes you might create a component that you don't want anyone to add manually to an object. It can be something internal that you want to add only programmatically. In that case, you can provide an empty string to the add component menu attribute. Now it will be impossible to add the component manually from the editor even if I search for the class name directly. The second trick is more interesting. It's not uncommon to create wrappers for frequently used Unity components in order to expand their functionality. For example, a UI button. We might want all buttons in our game to play some sound when they're clicked, or for those of you in the mobile gaming industry to set an analytics event. Instead of inheriting from the mono behavior class, we can inherit directly from the UI button class. Then, in a wake, we can subscribe to our own events. Just note that this time I'm overriding the method and calling the parent implementation, since button already has some logic in the awake method. With this approach, I'll be able to use my custom button everywhere I want. But sometimes when working in the editor, I or anyone else on the team can mistakenly add the default button instead of our custom one. And since it's so small, it can be even missed during the QA cycle. Thankfully, there's an easy way of handling it. In the Add Component menu, we can supply the exact path of a component we want to override. In my case, it's UI slash button. Now I can create a new image in the hierarchy, and I'll name it yellow button and add a sprite to it. Next, I'll add the button component to it. And if I search for the button component, there's only one here. Let's add it. To make it pretty, I'll change the transition to sprite swap and assign the relevant sprite. Now let's make sure it's our button. 
If I press on it, you can see two logs in the console. One telling us that a sound has played, and the other that the yellow button was pressed. We can add one more small touch to it. Let's locate the button script in the project. Now in the inspector we can change its icon. I'll select this green diamond, but you can even provide a custom image. Now in the inspector, when you see the button component, you will see the icon you selected. And that's it for today. Hopefully, at least one of these tricks makes your life a bit easier. Or at least makes you go, hmm. If you got your own weird Unity gems, drop them in the comment section. I always love discovering new stuff. And hey, if you enjoyed this one, hit the like button and maybe consider subscribing. It really helps. Keep on creating and I'll see you in the next one.